to deliver this year's uh, Doran Lecture on Population Resources <coughs> and Development. Uh, professor Sin is uh, currently the Professor of Economics and Public Finance in the, at the University of Munich. He is also President of the IFO Institute for Economic Research and also Director for the Center of Economic Studies at the University of Munich. <coughs> he did his graduate education at the University of Mannheim and he has held many visiting and research, visiting research positions, including at the Hebrew University, uh, the International Monetary Fund, Stanford University, Princeton University, the London School of Economics. He has uh, received many prizes and awards. I'll just mention briefly very few. Uh, the Europe Award from the University of Maastricht in 2008, uh, the Officers Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, the Prize of the Financial Times, <coughs> and the Honorary Professorship at the University of Vienna. Uh, he has published wi widely, uh, including nine main monographs and over 130 scientific articles. Uh, he has a book uh, forthcoming in English uh, from the MIT Press called The Green Paradox, and other titles include uh, Economic Decisions Under Uncertainty, Capital Income Taxation and Resource Allocation, and uh, Casino Capitalism, How the Financial Crisis Came About and What Needs to Be Done Now from Oxford University Press. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Uh, Professor Sin with us today, and he will be talking about a controversial topic, table or tank, and he'll explain what it is. Dear Barbara, thank you for the kind introduction. I uh, am very grateful for being invited here uh, to uh, this university where I indeed was 12 years ago for a longer visit and I have still very uh, kind memories of that time. Um, I must apologize first uh, 
the, the picture w which you see is not the picture which is on the screen. Uh, it, everything is yellow. Uh, so uh, what, is, uh, what is white is yellow, but hopefully it will work because it is not the, the color of uh, the slides which uh, um, should be important. But I hope one can detect everything. Yeah, this is my theme, table or tank, the rivalry between biofuels, fossil fuels, and nutrition. And uh, it has to do a little bit with population economics. I know that um, the Doran family has placed a particular emphasis here on this, and I'm very gl grateful and glad that Mr. Doran himself, and I understand his uh, son or what, is also here with us. It's a great honor. Uh, for me. Well, it has to do what I want to talk about with uh, the population path. Uh, here you see the world population from the year 600. Then we had 200 uh, million people in the world. And uh, through the Middle Ages we had 350. And then uh, when industrialization began, say around uh, 750 plus or minus, uh, uh, we had 630. That was the time when the coal mines were opened and uh, uh, the first industrial processes with fossil fuels really uh, took place. And after that, the population increased very rapidly to about uh, uh, seven uh, uh, billion, which we have now, and the projections are that we will go towards nine by the middle of the century. Now, the question is whether this is uh, compatible with our environmental goals. Will society, mankind, survive such a population growth? In particular, what about the CO2 problem? Will we uh, die in our CO2 waste at some stage because the world is blown up by global warming? That is my basic question, and I limit the question further uh, to the question of what bioenergy can contribute. Uh, you mentioned this book. About uh, which uh, is forthcoming with MIT Press. It, it did f come out two years ago with, uh, with Econ in Germany. It has 450 pages, the Das Grüne Paradoxon. Uh, and uh, I can, of course, not talk about the book. But this is one chapter of the book and, it, and, ex and an extension of it as I prepare it now for the, for the M MIT book. So I concentrate on bioenergy. What is bioenergy? Uh, here we use biomass to produce electricity, heat, or uh, make fuels out of biomass in order to run our engines with it. And we can use energy plants like uh, corn, rapeseed, sugar beets, sugar cane, and soybeans. Or we can, of course, in the traditional way, burn the timber. Or we could biogenic substances uh, such as straw, liquid manure, uh, wood uh, residues, waste animal tissues, landfill gas, and what have you, um, in some pro uh, being so processed in an appropriate way to generate electricity or fuel. So uh, the topics I want to discuss here uh, the greenhouse effect as such, just a memory of what we are talking. To. The primary energy or renewable energy, where do we get uh, the resources from currently? What is the contribution statistically of renewable energies thus far? Then I come to the biofuel problem and talk about uh, the potential for CO2 reductions. And then I come to the crucial question, uh, which uh, is the title of my talk, table or tank. Uh, should we use nutrition uh, to fill our stomach or uh, to run our cars? 
uh, with. Uh, and, and that indeed is the big problem uh, in terms of uh, the CO2 problem uh, when it comes to biofuel. Then I talk about the tortilla crisis in that context. You may have heard about that. And then uh, the wretched effect, which I think uh, characterizes an important development in history. Yeah, let me first explain to you um, what the CO2 problem is about. Suppose the world atmosphere would consist exclusively uh, of oxygen, nitrogen, and water, as it does actually to more than 99%. Um, then the temperature on Earth would be minus 18 degrees. The temperature is determined such that the in radiation from the sun is equal to the out radiation. Blue light comes in and uh, the Earth gets warm and long wave radiation goes back. One can't see it. It's even below the usual infrared radiation. But the amount of energy going out must be equal to what comes in in order to find an equilibrium. And how much goes out depends on the atmosphere. Suppose now we change the atmosphere and add a tiny little bit of CO2, only 0.04%. It's incredibly little. Uh, so precisely 380 ppm parts per million. This will make a whole lot of a difference and increase the temperature to 14.5 degrees by 32 degrees and make the world livable as livable as it is today, it, that is a comfortable uh, situation. Why? Because the CO2 acts as a filter absorbing the backward radiation. And still, an equilibrium is such that the out uh, radiation is equal to the incoming radiation. So if, despite the filter, there should, there's an equilibrium, it needs a higher temperature. In, uh, of uh, the Earth's surf surface. And here you see how sensitive uh, the temperature is with regard to the CO2. If this bit of CO2, which is, which is in the atmosphere, is increased only a tiny little bit by man's actions, then this has dramatic implications for, uh, for the temperature uh, of the air. We actually know quite a bit about what has happened in history with the CO2 content of the um, atmosphere. Here you see the result of uh, ice cone uh, measurements at the South Pole. Uh, you, you know, the uh, snow falls uh, on the land and uh, accumulates. And now if you dig a hole, you can go back in history and uh, you can analyze the ice, the isotopes um, uh, uh, of, of the water uh, atoms, uh, and you can also check the air bubbles which you find. And so in the air you can measure the CO2 content, and we can do that 800,000 years backwards. 3,200 meters deep is the hole, and that brings us 800,000 years. You see the up and down of the CO2 concentration. Here is the pre-industrial level. We had 280 ppm. And here we are now. This is my 0.04%. 380 ppm. It has already increased uh, by a third. And here is the temperature from the same dose which one digs out of the, the ice. From the... Uh, uh, from the isotope method, and one sees a similar uh, curve. There is obviously a strong correlation. There is a lot to be said about it. The correlation, however, goes from here to here and not from here to here, because if the seawater gets warmer, then uh, the CO2 gets out of the, out of the water and, and, and vice versa. Still, CO2 contributes in a sort of, as a sort of accelerator to this process, and uh, there's also the reverse causality, and that's what is interesting for us. Here you see uh, zero is the average of the last 1,000 years. Uh, this is the average over the last uh, 800,000 years. It was uh, at the pole uh, 4 degrees colder. The average was then 11.5 degrees of the whole, for the whole world. 
and this is the last warm period, this is the last ice age, and here is the pre-industrial temperature level of uh, 13.5 degrees or so, and uh, the actual temperature today is 14.5. According to the usual uh, forecasts, uh, we will, uh, this temperature will increase in the next 20 or 30 years be beyond uh, this point, which was the highest point in the last 800,000 years. So, uh, climate scientists are pretty sure about this. Of course, not everyone. It's like in economics, 5% of the guys say something different. But uh, the mainstream uh, is pretty sure about this process. In the Stern review, the fear is expressed that already uh, between 2035 and 50, we will have three degrees plus relative to pre-industrial times, so another two degrees from today. And uh, in a business as usual scenario, so without countermeasures being taken, by 2100, we will have five degrees rel more relative to pre-industrial times, four relative to today, because one degree more or less uh, has already been, it, uh, been, been measured. And we see that the North Pole indeed is melting. Unfortunately, the picture doesn't show it now because here that would be the Siberian coast. And uh, uh, a few years later, at the same period of the year, you see it's free. So, and, and here is the St. Lawrence Seaway. That's also nearly free. It was free occasionally. So the North Pole definitely is melting. This is not a myth. This is really happening. Now let's uh, come to our countermeasures. Uh, we want to have a new energy mix in the future to avoid the CO2 output. But in order to understand what the options are, I think it's useful to first see what we are doing um, or where we want to go. The EU has uh, proclaimed the 2020-20 goal, meaning that by 2020, uh, one wants uh, to cut the uh, energy, fossil energy consumption by 20% relative to 1990 and also have 20% of the uh, electricity from uh, uh, regenerative uh, sources. And uh, here you see where we are currently. Uh, there's still some way to go. This is supposed to be blue. Uh, that's the EU in the moment. So we would have to double uh, the uh, renewable energies. Where does our energy come from? This is the OECD average. <clears throat> you see that 13% uh, is coal. That's the total energy consumption. This is crude oil. This is gas. This is nuclear uh, energy, 5%. And uh, th these are the renewable sources here. If we take them out, you see that uh, here hydrogen, wind, hydrogen is strong, wind is unimportant, biomass is a huge chunk of the renewable uh, energy. Actually, it's, uh, it's bigger than the rest together. And this is solar, which is completely unimportant, and ge geothermal thus far. Of course, one might dream about expanding that, but you see here already today, when we talk about regenerative energy, it is um, biofuels where we get the largest mileage. And uh, probably in the future, if we want to expand, we will have to expand here. No? Uh, if we um, split it up, what is that? Uh, the bioenergy, biomass is used uh, typically for heating, so that's the good old stove where you put your wood in. But with bio, we make biofuel and we make also electricity from biomass. The other things might also be interesting. Uh, solar power is primarily solar thermal energy. If I look here from my hotel to the roofs, which I see in uh, Jerusalem, I know what this is they have the uh, shower water here. So that's an important thing. Photovoltaic, however, is uh, a minor contributor to uh, the energy. 
also one. Of course, it's a bit adding apples and pears because this is electricity. It's a better energy than this one. Uh, I don't want to go into the details here. Uh, coal is usually used uh, for uh, electricity. Um, uh, so the smaller part is for heating. Crude oil is, of course, for traffic fuels. A uh, little bit is for heating. And gas primarily is for heating and for electricity production. That's the energy mix of the world. And uh, going to uh, regenerative energy means to replace all this, it's a long way, by what we are doing here. And here, the emphasis empirically in the moment is really on bioenergy and nothing else. And let's see whether we can expand that further. That's the topic of this talk. And here, biofuel is the dream of many. Uh, we can create biofuels from vegetable oils. And actually, if you have um, a, a vegetable oil with an old diesel, you can directly pour it into the tank. It runs. An old Mercedes, the new one's not. The old ones do it. Uh, but it would, of course, be better to uh, uh, process uh, the oil to make biodiesel out of it. So one creates diesels, diesel substitutes from sunflower seeds, rape seeds, soybeans, and so on. You could also make biodiesel, um, yeah, um, oh, sorry, these are vegetable oils which are not processed. And then you can process it and you make uh, biodiesel, which is as good a diesel as, as the fossil diesel. Uh, the EU here concentrates on rapeseed. Uh, the uh, US, United States concentrate uh, on soybeans when it comes to biodiesel, but it's not so important there. And Southeast Asia on palm oil. And then, more important than biodiesel is bioethanol, which is alcohol. If you drink a gin, this is the stuff. Uh, it's the same. And um, they add, of course, some poison to it that it doesn't taste well. And you can make it from fermenting sugar. And uh, in the EU and the United States, one uses corn, wheat, rye for it, and sugar beets. And Brazil does it from sugar cane. And then in the future, hopefully, we could even generate biofuels out of uh, uh, those parts of the plant which we don't eat. That would be ideal. This is the second generation biomass to liquid approach. So we, we could use the lineal cellulosic biomass. No? You have, um, have uh, the soybean and the, uh, the bean itself can be eaten and the rest of the plant uh, you uh, transform with some technical means into, into a biofuel. That would be good, but it's still in the experimental phase. What is one doing? There are two possibilities. That's, the one is the Fischer-Tropsch method, method, which uh, actually was in, developed in Germany uh, to make uh, liquid fuel out of coal. It was used in the, in the 20s and 30s. And uh, this method was further extended in the GDR in East Germany, in communist Germany, and uh, so an engineer from that company uh, opened his private company in Freiburg, and he then cooperated with Shell to make, uh, uh, to, to have a big, um, what is that, uh, factory, not factory, but for uh, plant, uh, big plant for producing biodiesel. It works, but there are lots of uh, problems. It is not yet commercial, and they postpone. The, uh, the real operation year by year. So it's, uh, it's a sort of problem. But uh, theoretically, it works. And the other alternative would be to make bioethanol uh, by fermentation processes with uh, special uh, gene-devised uh, uh, bacteria that are able to crack uh, uh, the cells, which you'd, would not be uh, could not be eaten by man or by animals. 
This is more an approach used in the United States. But it's all in the experimental phase. We are not yet there. And we will see what the environmental implications are with this production process. So let's hope that it works. In the moment, this has no commercial importance. What is important is the bioethanol production, first of all. And here, most of the bioethanol comes from North America and uh, also very much comes from South America. North America corn, South America uh, sugar canes. The EU contributes only 4%. Well, if you want to split it up, it's France, Germany, and, and Spain, and so on. Huh? So that's not so important. And then we have biodiesel. The biodiesel production, what a surprise, is concentrated in the EU, not in America. The whole rest of the world has 24%, United States 6%, but the EU has here, uh, four quarter, three quarters nearly. And if we split that up, we see it's Germany primarily, and France, and a little bit Italy, and then come the other countries. Germany is really a strange uh, an outlier here. And not, when you come from Mars, fly, over, uh, fly around the Earth and, look, and inspect the countries, uh, when you see Germany, this, uh, the special thing is in, in spring, it's yellow from rapeseed plants, completely yellow, the whole country. Uh, the roofs are uh, twinkling because of the... Uh, um, uh, uh, photo uh, uh, cells, and there are these windmills which generate the electricity. Uh, Germany is world champion in terms of solar electricity production, by far. Uh, world champion in terms of uh, windmill electricity production, and world champion in terms of uh, biodiesel production, due to the huge subsidies which the government provides here. And uh, for this reason, of course, as a German, one is very, very interested in this kind of topic. Lots of uh, taxpayers' money go into that, actually. If, you, if we see the increase of the production, uh, we um, detect that here, in, uh, since about 2000, there is a rapid rise. Uh, that's the bioethanol production, and this is the biodiesel production. Biodiesel is not as important by no means as bioethanol, but there is a lot of momentum in this production process, and uh, due to the huge subsidies, uh, this will go up. Now, can we reduce CO2, CO2 uh, output by this? Theoretically, the thing is clear. Uh, we leave the fossil fuel in the ground, and uh, we just take the biomass, which has taken uh, the carbon out of the air through phot photosynthesis. No? So uh, it's reduced carbon, which is stored in the plant, and uh, if we burn that and combine it with oxygen, it goes back into the air. But again, we take it out uh, when the next plant grows. So it's a closed circuit. It doesn't become more and more. And if instead we can leave the fossil fuel in the ground, it would be good. Of course, this is by no means sure. Uh, actually, that's one of the weaknesses of this approach. Uh, how can we know that fossil fuel will stay in the ground if we just have biofuel? It could just be added to it. No? But uh, it's a different story. Suppose I make uh, biofuel. Um, how, much uh, how much could I go with a hectare? I have a hectare of land, and uh, I want to produce biodiesel from rape. Well, this would generate 1,400 uh, liters per year. And uh, with a normal-sized car, you could uh, drive about 23,000 kilometers a year. Sounds rather reasonable. One hectare for me, for you, for everyone, and then it's fine. Why not? It doesn't a hectare. Uh, 10,000 square meters. It's not so... Not so... What? 10 dunams. 
And uh, with bioethanol, the, the calculation is similar. We get even more liters, 1,660 out of it, and we, this is enough for a normal car to run 22,000 kilometers per year. Fine. So one hectare would do it. But um, is it really working? That's the question. Uh, many people have discussed whether... Uh, uh, how, how expensive it would be uh, to go this way and reduce CO2 uh, by biofuel use or by other technical means. And here is an interesting uh, study by Ulrich Fahl from the University of Stuttgart whose um, calculations I want to show you. The question is, um, suppose we want to reduce one ton of fossil fuel CO2 output uh, with some alternative technology. How much would that ton cost? What is the abatement cost per ton of CO2 with regard to uh, fossil origin of that CO2? Of course, if we have nuclear energy, it costs nothing. Uh, depending on the plant, it might cost a little bit, or you save even money relative to that must be said, a normal coal power plant generating electricity. Um, more modern plants, gas plants, which uh, have two turbines using the, the ga gas uh, directly and then making uh, heating water and using the vapor of, of the water another time, uh, are very efficient. Uh, they would uh, reduce the CO2 output relative to a coal plant. But here you would have to pay between 21 and 34 uh, euros per avoided ton of uh, fossil CO2. Solar heat, so the Israeli solution with the roofs for the, for the shower is, costs between 29 and 75 uh, euros per ton avoided. Wind energy between 37 and 91. Now it, we come to the more expensive solutions. If you take a modern diesel engine and make it even more efficient, then depending on the quality of the, the, of the engine, it costs between 52 and even 254. A modern, really modern diesel engine is very, very expensive because it's already efficient. To make it even more efficient is very costly. But you could insulate your houses better. If you have an old house, you may even save money. It costs you nothing. You have a cost of minus 113 uh, euros per avoided uh, ton of CO2. But if you take a modern house, uh, uh, this is according to the German Dean standards, and if you want to uh, make that insulate that even better than it is already insulated, it, that could also be, uh, come expensive, 300 and something. More efficient gas um, engines, petrol engines, could be very expensive, 415. Geothermal power, 540, is very expensive to dig these deep holes, hundreds of meters deep or thousands. Ne? Biofuels, there we are. That's a very expensive way of doing it. Between 215 and, uh, and 600 euros per avoided ton of CO2. And the most expensive thing is photovoltaic sense. Okay, the prices are coming down. What country is it based on? What country? Yeah, geothermal power, for example, in Iceland. Yeah, no, this is uh, for German conditions. Yeah, yeah. We have lots of uh, volcanoes in Germany, uh, so it's not uh, so absurd to dig the holes uh, and come close to them, but it's not Iceland, no. Uh, there is another study which is even more pessimistic by Krutzen. Krutzen is the Nobel Prize winner. Um, and uh, he uh, published recently a study about uh, nitrous oxid, uh, oxygen, uh, oxid. Uh, it's uh, the laughing gas. And he argues that uh, bioethanol produced from corn is actually more harmful than 
fossil fuel. Why? Because um, the, uh, if you, you have to put a lot of nutrients on the, on the soil and uh, you can't uh, make the dose so, so precise that uh, it just fits what the plant absorbs, but there's a waste uh, of nutrients and uh, there are some reactions with bacteria and so on uh, leading to the production of uh, nitrous oxide emissions and uh, that is very very dangerous because nitrous oxide per unit of weight has a CO2 has a has a climate effect which is 300 times that of of CO2 it's a very dangerous climate gas and uh, he argues that biodiesel from rapeseed is 70% uh, more harmful than use, using fossil petrol. Another problem with the biofuel approach is the slash and burn strategy, which we see in some developing countries. Look here, for example. Well, there's such a wonderful picture. I, uh, I show it to you here. You know, here. This is the... Uh, my glass, yeah, take the glass. This is the rainforest, no? a wonderful rainforest. And uh, they burn it. And uh, as a result of that, uh, a lot of CO2 immediately goes into the air. The wood contains the reduced carbon, and upon burning, there is a burst of CO2. And even if later on the same soil you uh, place uh, sugar canes so that you have the advantage of biofuels, it would t take you a lot of years in order to compensate uh, with assuming that uh, you use less um, um, fossil fuels to compensate for the initial burst. So what's the, uh, the biological amortization period? That's the question here. If you produce ethanol from sugarcane and in the Brazilian savanna, where there was no forest, okay, then after 17 years, you're on the plus side. After 17 years, you begin to save CO2. If uh, you uh, uh, cut down the rainforest and burn the wood, then you have to wait 75 years uh, until you begin to have an environmental advantage. Um, if you produce biodiesel from palm oil in uh, tropical rainforests, um, in, uh, in regions which were former tropical rainforests, in Malaysia and Indonesia, you need 86 years. And if these tropical rainforests were um, uh, oh, sorry, no, if, uh, if you uh, produce biodiesel from soy seeds in, in Brazil and cut down the rainforest, you would have to wait 319 years. And uh, if these tropical rainforests, that's what I wanted to say, um, are on previous peat, and, uh, which you would have to, uh, where you would have to uh, 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 make water drainage systems, uh, then uh, a lot of additional CO2 comes out of the soil because the peat is reduced carbon. It reacts with oxygen when the water is going away and you would have to wait 400 years. So that's an additional problem. But now the main problem with the biofuel approach is this. The rivalry between uh, nutrition and energy for, um, for machines of any sort. There's a competition for farmland. Well, when you think of my example that we need about one hectare per person, that might not seem too much. So uh, is that perhaps reasonable, uh, the quantity which we need? Well, let's make a thought experiment. Suppose we just replace all liquid fuels which mankind uses for transportation primarily in the air, on the water, and for cars, which itself is one-fifth of the total CO2 output of mankind. Suppose we replace the, just that with biofuels. How much land would we need? 
Well, I take different percentages. If 10% of the traffic of the world would run with biofuels, then we would need about 10% of the world acreage or one third of the EU acreage for that. For 20%, it's this number, these numbers. For, if we want to replace everything, we have no fossil fuel anymore, we do everything with biofuel, then we have these numbers. And if I may highlight this, uh, so one third of the EU arable land would be needed to cover just one tenth of the current fuel consumption in the EU, in the EU. And for the whole world, if we wanted to uh, fully replace the fossil fuel with biofuels, we would need the whole land which is available. This is not my calculation, but these are two calculations done by the International Energy Agency and the OECD. And what, what I just did is used their approach and applied it to the EU. So that's rather disappointing. But this is just first generation. First generation. It's the first generation, not BTL, the current production method. Which right. is definitely, people know for a long time that it is not a relevant solution. Yeah, so but that's a, yes, 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 yes. That's what I said. It's exactly what I said, no? But in the moment, this is the problem, and it's not so easy to get get mileage by just uh, uh, pursuing the current approach. Now, is there fellow farmland which we could use, perhaps? In Europe, there is none. There was some uh, under the EU regulations some years ago, but it's over. And uh, worldwide, I don't know. But uh, it's hard to imagine that in a populated world, there is fellow farmland which is not used uh, even though uh, uh, nutrition could be produced. Um, there's a lot of debate here. The main problem is this. Do you remember these pictures? That was Mexico, January 2007. A demonstration that w because the tortilla prices had gone up enormously. What are tortillas? This, are, this is a sort of bread made from corn, the corn being imported from the United States. Uh, the corn price went up, and so the tortilla prices went up, and poor people in particular had a problem with this because that was their main nut nutrient. A year later, we had uh, uh, lots of demonstrations. In, in Toto, we had a hunger demonstrations in 37 countries of the world. This is Honduras, and this is Senegal just a year later. I think the tortilla crisis shows uh, that there might be a problem. Let's go into the details. The question is, was this biofuels what uh, drove up the prices of, of uh, food, or was it something else? I think it was. And uh, I show you a couple of graphs here. This is the uh, world market price of, uh, of corn. Let's take um, January 2005 as 100. You see there was an increase uh, by 250% uh, uh, from 100 to 350 here in the peak. And here was the tortilla crisis. Okay, so here is supposed to be a red point, which you can't see. Um, and uh, this is the tortilla crisis at this point. There we had already a, an 80% increase in the price level relative to this point. Here, the curve you can't see either. That's, uh, that's wheat, but you can... Maybe you can see it. You can, what you see here, it follows this peak with a delay of one year. So what has happened? Uh, when the corn prices went up, uh, farmers changed. Thank you. 
farmers changed their land and produced corn rather than wheat, so we had a wheat shortage. And uh, so one harvest period later, the wheat price um, was going up. And then this is the rice price. That's supposed to be a blue curve. You see it goes up here. It follows half a year later and has a similar peak. And what happened here, it's not that the farmers could decide to produce rice on the land on which they formerly produced corn. Uh, that is not possible. But the consumers substituted away from the expensive corn and wheat towards rice, and that drove up the rice prices. Now, some information here. How important was the, the, the corn production, uh, the, the ethanol production? In the United States in the year 2007, 8% of the agricultural land of the United States was already used for the bioethanol production. And 30% of the corn harvest went into bioethanol. It's not a minor, tiny thing at the margin. It was already biting into the, to the output. The increase in the world corn production between 2004 and 2007, the total increase is equal in size to the increase in the corn demand for bio, bioethanol in the United States alone. Uh, the Food Institute, IFPRI, in the United States uh, did an e econometric analysis of this, and they argued that 40% of the increase in food prices between 2000 and 2007 can be attributed to the effect of biofuel. And there is another study by Mitchell from the World Bank, he's an economist at the World Bank, who argued that up to 75% of the increase in food prices between 2002 and 2008 can be attributed to biofuel. Both are sound econometric studies uh, with all the techniques which you could wish. Actually, the World Bank study uh, circulated. It was first a secret paper, but it circulated. They wanted to keep it covered, uh, but uh, given that it had leaked out the bank, in the end, a couple of months later, they had, uh, they had to publish that paper because it was, of course, a very sensitive and problematic uh, information that came out of this, this study by Mitchell. And, um, and then the prices went down. Why did the prices went down? They went down when the economic crisis came, when there was a general reduction in demand. The oil price went down. All these prices went down uh, at the same time. And uh, when the new boom pops up, probably uh, it will, uh, all prices will, will increase again. Or there might have been a bubble in the oil price, but the, the price was the price. And there was an incentive to uh, uh, deliver the corn no longer to the food stores, but to the filling stations, the even if it was a bubble. Yeah, but if it was a bubble, then it's not clear regarding future prediction. No, no. No, of course we don't know what the future oil price will be, but we know oil is an exhaustible resource. And um, it's, from, from an economic perspective, it's impossible that the price doesn't go up. No? It becomes scarcer and, and scarcer, and the world may even be growing. Uh, so uh, the price is, uh, is going to increase without limits, without, uh, for the time being at least. No? This is what all reasonable uh, models predict. I don't know any exception, actually. Well, if there is a perfect substitute, then you could limit if we have nuclear fusion. But before the nuclear fusion point, you know, uh, there is... There. 
No, 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 I don't mean that. Uh, the, there is a stock of resources in the ground, it's limited, and you uh, dwell out of this existing stock, uh, the remaining stock becomes smaller and smaller, so the quantity is extracted, the flow per unit of time has also to become smaller and smaller at some point. It is clear that there will be an oil peak, and some people argue we are already there. Others uh, say, no, we are not yet there, but there will be an oil peak. It's unavoidable that there is an oil peak. And so in the end, the prices will have to increase without limits. So I would, uh, just to, to explain that, uh, given this relationship, one should argue that the, that the farmers should inde indeed uh, join OPEC. Uh, given that I'm from Germany, I have to say that is meant to be a joke. Uh, the price declined. The production probably did not so much decline because you have the land, you, uh, you harvest uh, whatever you have there. I don't think the production... The use of corn for production of fuel. Yeah, good question. I can't answer it, honestly. Uh, but I would have to look into it. If, if maybe one has the numbers. But now let me point you to, uh, to an effect which I find important. I, I would like to call that the wretched effect because something which was separate suddenly interlinks. It's a new phase of history that, which has to do with the one-way substitution between uh, uh, table and tank or um, uh, nutrition and, um, and fossil fuel. Um, it, if you eat your salad, you put salad oil on it. Um, it's not advisable to take crude oil or anything derived from it. It won't taste, it would harm you, it's not possible. One tried hard. I, I remember for decades one has discussed the possibility with certain bacteria to convert uh, fossil fuel into something eatable. It never worked. No? So. In this direction, no substitution possibility. But the other possibility is there. You can take the salad oil from the supermarket and pour it into your tank. Or first refine it and then pour it into your tank. So it's a one-way substitution. And this one-way substitution is very important because it says that uh, the, uh, uh, the fossil fuel market and the nutrition market are separate as long as the oil price per unit of energy is lower than the nutrition price per unit of energy. Hmm? But once the oil price rises and reaches the nutrition price, then suddenly these two markets interlink. That's the ratchet effect. Yeah? And uh, uh, the, the nutrients, the food, is delivered no longer to the supermarket, but to the tank. And uh, I believe that the world hunger crisis, the Tortilla crisis, and the 37 uh, countries that demonstrated are a reflection to this wretched effect, this sudden interlinkage between the two markets. Now we have the recession and the oil prices are low. Now we have a period of easing. But when the next boom comes, and the oil prices go up again, and probably to a higher level than in the previous boom, because the whole trend is rising, then we will have the same mess again. And the periods of linking these two markets will become longer and longer, and the periods of recession where there is no linkage will become uh, rare. And in the end, there will be a full linkage. So we are in the historical phase of mankind's development where these two markets begin to be linked. It's a point in history, actually. And uh, this is interesting if you look back to Sheffield and the oil, uh, uh, no, sorry, the, the coal production there and the industrialization in the middle of the 18th century. At that time, food and energy prices were, of course, linked because there was only one source of energy, which was, uh, which was uh, food, for animals or for men. Okay, it was not exactly the same type, but it was biofuel. 
No? In, up to the, the end of the Middle Ages, until industrialization, energy always was biofuel. And then came a phase when uh, we detected the, the use of uh, fossil fuels and the two markets became separate. Fossil fuel was cheaper than biofuels and the land was set free for the produ production of food. And now we are back to the old period. So what it means is that the Malthusian constraint in the population development, which was binding until the Industrial uh, Revolution, will again be binding. The escape from the Malthusian trap, which mankind succeeded to manage with uh, the fossil fuels, uh, that period of escape is over. So let's look back to this or diagram. We or we need another industrial revolution. That's right. So this is the phase of bioenergy until, say, uh, 1750 or so, no? when the industrial revolution took place in Britain. That was the bioenergy phase. And here it comes, and that you can't read. This is in red. Red, it doesn't show. This is fossil fuel, OK? And, uh, and in this period, now the population begins to increase because the land, which formerly was used for the animals, could be used for uh, the production of nutrition. You know? I, uh, I, I don't have a good source for it, but um, um, uh, a professor from agriculture told me, and if anyone has something citable, I would like to have it, that... Uh, before the industrialization, 70%, two-thirds or so, of the land was used for the animals and therefore just for, just for transportation purposes. Only one-third of the land uh, was used to produce nutrition for men. I don't know whether that's right. I have, But just to give you an idea of what the potential problem here is. And uh, here we are, the, are now. And now we are back to a situation where uh, we might go, uh, might return to bioenergy because of the ratchet effect, because the two markets are coupled, coupled, coupled again. Uh, I have a schematic sort of graph to illustrate my thoughts, just to fix ideas. Suppose this is the nutrition price. Um, okay, <laughs> it's a, so bad. Here is a red line. I, it's, no, you have to look at this one here. It, uh, does, that doesn't show it. It's important. Oh, no, it comes. Okay, it comes. I don't touch it anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, then uh, the energy price falls below the nutrition price. When industrial revolution comes and one detects methods of using the fossil energy here. The bioenergy phase is ending and the fossil energy phase begins. The two prices are put apart. This is the period of the Malthusian constraint. And this is now the period of rapid population growth because the land which formerly was used for the bioenergy is available for food production. So indeed, from 1750 onwards, there was an enormous increase in the European population. The time uh, of, uh, uh, the population increase that lasted throughout the 19th century. And, but over time, the uh, fossil fuel price increases due to the increased scarcity because the stuff is limited in the soil and because of population growth, because of economic growth, because of everything. And here we are today. That's my, my story. We are back where the two prices are interlinked. And now uh, the question is, could the fossil fuel prices, according to the hoteling rule, continue to increase? 
or will there be something happening? Well, there will be something happening. The two prices are connected. So uh, food goes into the energy market, drives down uh, the price of oil, but at the same time, uh, the scarcity of food drives up the price of food. The two prices from now on again develop a parallel. And what we have seen since the Industrial Revolution was just an intermediate period where temporarily the price of uh, uh, fossil energy, of energy for transportation purposes and machines and so on was lower than the price of food. And now we are back in the Malthusian world where the two prices are coupled, which would have implications for future population growth, for the stability, social stability of the world, and what have you. I am deeply convinced if we look back, say, by 2050 to this period, the years 2007 and 2008, with the Tortilla crisis and everything that follows from it, we will see it as a change of paradigm in mankind's development of this sort. Dollar twenty-five a day line shrank from 52% of the world population to only 25. As a result of globalization and factor price equalization mechanisms, the wages uh, in many countries were driven up. Think of China, India. They participate now. And uh, in total, we have now uh, uh, f uh, 45% of, the, of mankind which are living in emerging countries which also want to on, and can probably participate in our growing um, uh, living standard trend. But when I'm right, if I'm right, this period is now over. This was the end of it. It's the sort of doomsday theory. I am sorry, uh, but uh, you know, we have a dismal science, so what do you want? Uh, and I have, to, to summarize that, I have a sort of environmental impossibility theorem. There is a dismal triangle. We have three goals. Uh, we want to uh, keep control the climate, we want to have energy, and we want to have nutrition. Mm -hmm. There are three possible goals, but we can't reach these three goals at the same time, at least not with this technology biofuel. I only talk about this. I don't talk about other technologies. We can talk about that. Uh, if we want to go the biodiesel way uh, to preserve the climate and have still the energy for our machines as before, then we won't have no nutrition. If we want to have nutrition and a good climate, without that means we don't take the fossil fuel out of the ground, we won't have energy for our machines. And uh, if we want to have energy and nutrition, that is, we take the fossil fuel out of the ground and use our land to produce food as before, then we have a, a climate problem and we can't satisfy that goal. We can't, one of the goals we just can't satisfy. And that's a dismal uh, sort of solution, or not a solution, problem. So my conclusions. Renewable energy targets can probably only be reached with biofuels. What the EU wants, 20% renewable energy, only biofuels give you the mileage. The rest is marginal. Um, there is a dubious climate benefit because of the laughing gas problem, Kruzenet and, and others, which needs to be discussed. There is anyway a huge farmland consumption. We would need the whole, under current technologies, I must say, uh, the whole acreage of the world just to cover the traffic of the world with biofuels, which itself is one-fifth of the energy consumption of the world. The tortilla crisis and 
the crises, the food crisis in another 36 countries was caused by biofuels. In particular, the American move towards uh, ethanol production. A move, by the way, which came about not only by market forces, the increasing oil price, but the government also um, subsidized this and uh, stimulated a process which would have taken place anyway further with subsidies. Uh, they built up an infrastructure for the bioethanol bio production in the United States. The ratchet effect means that after a, a long period of time from the Industrial Revolution when mankind learned to uh, use fossil fuels until now, during this period of time, the fossil fuel price was unrelated to the nutrition price. It was strictly smaller, but now uh, the price has reached the competitive level where uh, it is competitive with nutrition. Uh, sorry, it is where it is, it, yeah, yeah, where, um, where nutrition becomes competitive with, uh, with, with uh, energy for, for machine and traffic use. And uh, therefore, the two markets interlink. They did not interlink before, remember, because of the one-way substitution between nutrition and fossil fuels. You, can put the, uh, you can't put the crude oil on your salad, but you can put the vegetable oil in your tank. This is important. I mean, I mean it in, a, in an extended way, but I think it's important. And that, that leads to the ratchet effect, this sudden interlinkage of these two markets. And uh, we, in general, we have a problem uh, because of this dis dismal triangle. Uh, with bioenergy, we will not be able uh, to satisfy these three goals at the same time, namely having a good climate, having enough to eat, and having enough energy for our cars and our machines. Yeah, uh, this is what I wanted to tell you. Uh, I'm, I, I know we are, I'm invited for dinner tonight, and uh, the problem has not yet arrived here in Jerusalem, and that's the good news. Thank you very much for your attention.
So I, I'm very impressed by the connection that you made between the, the <coughs> from the economic reasons, uh, nutrition and energy. But I'm less worried than you are because the technical, you call it revolution, um, is already here. I mean, the biotechnology, which is just picking up now, uh, will be able to. I mean, these figures are based on using the seeds of a crop. But as you mentioned, the lignocellulose, you know, the waste, contains a lot more energy. Now, I believe that biotechnology uh, will be able to uh, utilize this energy in an in environmentally friendly way, and the whole equation is going to change. Yeah, hopefully. Um, there is indeed... Uh, a lot of hope here, and I read a lot about it. I uh, became rather enthusiastic about this Fischer-Tropsch uh, approach. Um, but then I read uh, a report of the German Environmental Council. These are biologists and environmental uh, researchers uh, who are really green. Yeah? And, and, and they uh, argued that uh, it won't really work because uh, uh, for the normal farming cycle, you would have to put these parts of the plant back to the soil in order to uh, yeah, keep the soil intact. And uh, they argued when, when you withdraw it and, and, uh, and produce liquid elsewhere out of it, then uh, the, the next harvest will have problems. And uh, they argued, therefore, we are, uh, that these approaches with BTL, which we are currently seeing, are not yet uh, convincing, even if they would work. Um, I, I, I can give you the reference if you're interested. Yes? I'd like to challenge your view of uh, oil prices. Um, um, you cut this schematic graph with uh, energy prices, fossil fuel prices rising during the uh, last few hundred years. I know it was only schematic, but the truth is, is that uh, real fossil fuel prices were falling over the last 200 years, and they, they were falling until OPEC was formed in the early 1970s. Well, OPEC was formed in the 1960s, but they didn't manage to use their power until the early 1970s. Everybody then said, right, it's a shortage of a finite resource until the oil price collapsed in 1985. And then everybody said, no, it was just OPEC interfering with the supply of energy. And then it happened again. I think Tom is right that the, uh, what we saw uh, two years ago was uh, a, a fear and of a bubble. It was like a bubble effect in oil prices. But once um, economic growth resumes and there's some kind of business as normal, then your view that somehow it's a finite resource, therefore oil prices have got to go up in the end. Well, people have been saying that about coal. William Stanley Jevons said that about coal in 1850. You know, that the Industrial Revolution would come to an end by 1900 because coal resources were better. So people have been spilling this doom watch view about primary energy and have been proved wrong time and time again. So um, I think this kind of dismal view of the future and that energy prices must rise and then the tank table uh, conflict will come into force. I just don't think it's going to happen. You've got a very very, I would say, specific view about the effect of depletable resources, which is don't think supported by what's actually happened. Well, the only difference is it has happened in but 2007, real prices, 2008. Real world prices now. Yeah, no, they are, as high. I said, they are they disentangled again. But uh, it's not just a theory. Just it is a, an explanation of something which we have seen. Uh, the world hunger crisis. So give me your explanation of what happened in 2007 and 2008. No, I'm saying there was a bubble in the oil market and well, oil prices were... Food yeah, prices well, were then it comes to, to the question of whether oil prices will increase or not. Um, 
You are right, first of all, that we have had a long period where the discoveries of new oil fields and coal fields and so on drove down the prices, which is not in my schematic graph. No? Indeed, uh, rather than after this initial decline, when fossil fuels popped up, it declined further. It declined further. You're perfectly right. But this doesn't change anything in my story. No? If it ultimately increases, and... Uh, now I can only allude you to um, uh, about 2,000 papers uh, about the resource problem, which all predict that uh, the price of oil and other fossil fuels has to go up. It's, it's simply impossible for me to, be, to, to envisage a situation where it won't. I uh, don't know what the scenario would be. We would need um, a perfect substitute to oil uh, in order to prevent that. The, the timing is, of course, unclear. Maybe you're right that for another 50 years uh, the prices stay low. I don't think so, but uh, the point is at some stage uh, the prices will rise sufficiently. There is no way about it because uh, we don't have a perfect substitute in sight for fossil fuels. Even if nuclear fusion would work, would it not be a perfect substitute? Why? Because uh, nuclear fusion generates electricity, and electricity is not the same as fossil fuels, because fossil fuels is the liquid, the matter, which um, um, uh, stores uh, the maximum amount of energy in a given um, unit of weight. Uh, we have no similar uh, devices. For example, from uh, electricity, you can, make, you can make hydrogen, of course. Uh, but the hydrogen, uh, uh, even if, if, if it is compressed uh, to, to liquid, which needs uh, very low temperatures and so on, needs a lot of space and is, is very, very heavy because of all the aggregates which you need to keep it cool uh, so that it is liquid. And if you don't want to make it liquid, if you just want to compress it as a gas, then even with the maximum compression, it uh, needs 11 times or so the, the space uh, per unit of energy than, uh, let's say, kerosene. And you will never ever be able, or it's hard to imagine, uh, be able to uh, run an airplane on something that is generated from electricity. So. It's a substitute, it's not a perfect substitute. And if it is not a perfect substitute, and if the fossil fuel stock dwindles to zero, as it logically has to do, oh, come on, uh, that's a matter of logic. It be when it, years. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no. Uh, can I just make, make a point about what you were saying about nuclear fusion or even nuclear fission? There has been some research. I which I read with the guy, the guy read a book called The Methanol Economy, and it's possible with electricity, with heat that's generated from power plants, to uh, take CO2 out of the atmosphere and combine it with water and create methanol. And methanol is a liquid fuel, and it is transportable, and it can be used. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's yeah, so in principle you could produce light with electricity, and the light could be used for photosynthesis, and with the photosynthesis you can produce um, a substitute for fossil fuels. That is right, yeah. But uh, this is uh, a remote, as far as I see, a remote uh, and very extremely expensive uh, possibility. No? And uh, it would deliver uh, a, a substitute at a multiple of the current price. And at the current price, we have already the interlinkage between the food prices. So it will not, whether the price goes on for infinity or not is not so important for this story. It is only important that it stays above the nutrition price. And it's, that's not a very strong assumption, I think. I'm a master's degree student uh, in biotechnology here in the Hebrew University, working with uh, Professor Hadal here from the Faculty, faculty of uh, Agriculture, Lechovot. I have a specific question which you didn't exactly address, but if you have any knowledge, it would help. Um, there are some countries, especially in South America, 
where subsidiaries or specifically incentives from the government really increase the production of biofuels, primarily Brazil. My specific question is whether or not over time this really shows an increase in biofuel production, you know, as opposed to countries where you don't see these incentives. I think so. In uh, Brazil, you have, uh, I think, 25% of the gas uh, of the filling station is coming out of um, is, is bioethanol, uh, and it's only due to the government intervention. Uh, I don't think it would have happened uh, through market forces alone. And really the 2020-20 uh, uh, proposal of the European Union, is that really, uh, can that really work without you know, serious government uh, intervention? No, no way. No way. It only works with government. We have huge uh, subsidies. Uh, to give you an idea, in Germany, the solar energy um, it has feeding-in tariffs, which uh, are currently in the order of 40 cents per kilowatt. And the market price, the retail price, uh, no, the, the wholesale price for uh, electricity is 5 cents. So it's eight times as expensive. And uh, wind uh, mill uh, electricity, uh, wind electricity, is uh, has a price which is 80 percent above uh, the market price. Similar water, electricity from water and so on. So uh, there are huge, huge, uh, enormous government subsidies. It has been calculated by an institute in Germany, the RWI, that Germany is spending uh, yeah, I must say, would have been spending until 2015 125 billion euros just for solar uh, electricity uh, via the feeding in tariffs, had they not been changed. But they have just now been changed as a reaction to that. Yeah? Um, I have two comments on Michael's comment. Um, the first, uh, I mean, everyone knows the story about Peter and the wolf. Peter cries wolf, and no wolf cry uh, comes, and that happens a few times. But the, at the end, the wolf actually comes, and then everyone ignores it. Uh, so that might be a bit similar here. Um, the second comment I have is, is perhaps a bit theoretical, but um, I'm working on these kind of uh, models with exhaustible resources, and I'm looking at situations where, where uh, well, a, a, a common argument that, that we won't have a problem is that people foresee that the oil price will go up and the, then they will invent the substitute. Um, and that, that means that people have to look into the future. Yet uh, the most common reason that people state that the oil price won't go up is always looking at the past, saying that it hasn't happened for the last 200 years, even though, even though um, people have said it before. So, so I don't know if, if, if history is, is a good way of judging what will happen in the future. Uh, rather, we should look into the future and, and, and make decisions based on that. So um, I agree with you. We don't know if the oil price will go up in 50 years or in 10 years or maybe in 1,000 years. But, but uh, uh, the logic of it, I, I, to me, is just inescapable. And I'll give you one explanation for why the oil price has been so low. I didn't talk about that today. This is what I called in my book, which gave the title to my book, The Green Paradox. Um, uh, the argument is that um, the oil price has been so low over the last uh, three decades or so, um, um, despite the rapid growth of the world economy, uh, because of uh, the announcement of green policies. That's the green paradox. So we have started to discuss green um, or, or technological alternatives since about the 80s. Then it became a big movement. And uh, these announcements uh, that there would be uh, sunlight, electricity, windmills, whatever, yeah? Uh, became more and more and more, and uh, nowadays, every second weekend, uh, the newspaper has has an addendum uh, describing all the technological possibilities. No? Uh, so everyone knows about the technological options, and we are talking and dreaming about it. And the oil shakes are not stupid; they read that, and they're afraid that 
a, a substitute technology would uh, come uh, with government help that destroys their markets. And what, the, what are they doing? They anticipate that and they sell more than they otherwise would have done. And so the oil price is low and uh, we consume more energy than we would have done without it. That's a, uh, also a sort of dismayal paradox. I like, obviously, these dismayal paradoxes. Uh, but I'm deeply convinced that this is one of two major explanations why the, why the oil price in the last three decades has been so low. The green music without actions uh, announcing for the future uh, the catastrophe for the oil shakes, the destruction of their markets. What can these guys do so before this happened? Hmm? And there's, of course, another problem. It's the uncertainty about property rights in the oil-extracting countries, which means that there is an artificial incentive to extract now to safeguard uh, your wealth on a Swiss bank account rather than waiting uh, for the expropriation th uh, in the next revolution where your rival takes over the government and all the, the oil fields. But these two uh, things, the expropriation via a revolution from your rival and the expropriation by green policy measures, I think both have worked in the same direction and induced the resource owners to extract faster than they otherwise would have done, depressing the world market prices. And so, a fortiori, if this is all true, we cannot at all infer from looking to the past what will happen to the future. Because if this theory is right, then it just means that the price is l lower today and higher tomorrow than it otherwise would have been. A fortiori, will we see a sharp increase? So it's just the opposite. The lower the price in the past, the higher it will be in the future. There's no way to infer from empirical observations the what will. Sheiks are making mistakes. Pardon? The, the sheiks are making mistakes. Uh, I'm not. Well, when they. Uh, they shouldn't believe uh, those stories. That's what you say. Oh no! I think the the alternative energies may come, uh, subsidized by government action. Europe goes now uh, for electric cars. You know, Sarkozy has his atomic power. He pushes the Europeans uh, to, towards the electric car, and uh, that will contribute to reducing the energy consumption, the, the fossil fuel consumption. Knowing all that, these guys have to extract now, before Sarkozy has uh, managed to change the market. You, you could argue, could you not, though, that um, it's, it's rational for the shakes to leave the oil in the ground if they think the price is going to rise. Yeah, it has to rise faster than the rate of interest. Uh, uh, otherwise, um, it's not worth. There is an equilibrium which we call the hoteling equilibrium. Uh, the extract the oil in a speed which uh, ensures that the capital gains on the resource left in the ground are comparable to the rate of interest. Which they could earn on the yeah. And if you now um, uh, carry out policy measures that would reduce the rate of price increase of the extracted oil, you would also reduce the rate of capital gains on the resource in situ and therefore create an artificial incentive to uh, change your portfolio, keep a lower fraction of your wealth underground and a larger fraction on the Swiss bank account.
Oh yeah, okay. I understand what you say. The energy gets scarcer anyway. Even if you take the whole land uh, for energy production, it may not uh, be enough to uh, satisfy our energy needs. Could, energy could, or food yeah, needs. Yeah. 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 You don't need the triangle. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's even worse. It's even worse. <laughs> yeah. You're a good dismay list. You're a good dismay list. <laughs>